starting with the, the big question of all three questions we're looking at these three weeks, which is, did Jesus really exist? And for those of us in this room, it might seem an obvious answer to that question. And yet, even though there are lots of reasons to believe that he did exist, there are many who doubt it, and many who don't yet know the right resources to be able to think more clearly and accurately uh, about the existence of Jesus. The key scripture, as we begin not only tonight's class, but this series, is this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, which says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And this series is about being better prepared. It feels good to be prepared, to know you're ready for things. I went suit shopping this week, because as most of you know, Lydia is getting married. My daughter's getting married, and that means I have to look smart. And I have a couple of suits, but they're rather old. So I needed to buy a new suit. And I went to a place in, uh, in Hatfield with my wife, because I don't trust myself. And we went to a, night, a, a shop and a very nice young man helped me to buy a well-fitted suit. He also persuaded me that I needed to buy a waistcoat. Um, I, I'm to be the father of the bride, I must have a waistcoat. I don't understand that, but apparently that's the case. And he also said I must have a particular kind of tie and a uh, little handkerchief thing that goes in the pocket and it has to match. And Anyway, I am now fully equipped and I feel better prepared for uh, the event that's coming up. And it's a, it's a nice feeling to know, I mean, it's May and the wedding's in August. That's sorted. Okay, good. I can relax a bit more and be a bit more petrified about writing my speech, but that's another thing. The feeling prepared is such a good feeling, not just for the sake of feeling good about it, but knowing that you've got what someone might need. And so we want to be prepared well. However, <laughs> we want to be well prepared, but we don't want to be prepared in the sense that we know we can win any argument people give us. I know I have all the cards up my sleeve and I'm going to win. The problem with going into a conversation with someone who's got doubts about these questions with the perspective of I'm going to win is that you make the other person what? You make them a loser. And if you make someone feel like a loser, are they going to want to carry on talking to you? Who wants to carry on talking to someone who makes them feel like a loser? This is also, by the way, this is a free point. This is why you don't want to win in arguments with your spouse. <laughs> You really don't. You don't want to win because you make your spouse into the loser and then you're married to a loser. So what does that do to the dynamics of your marriage? Anyway, that's a side point. We, we don't want to be pointing fingers at people. How could you believe that? That's a dumb thing to think. Look, I've got evidence and I'm going to hammer you over the head with it. Uh, that's, that's really not going to help. Instead, we need to heed the rest of this verse, which says, but do this with gentleness and respect. What do you think, let's, let me get a bit of feedback here, what does gentleness look like when you're having a conversation with someone about evidences? What is, how do you know you're being gentle? How, what would you say, Michelle? One of the things I learned today was actually how to be a better listener. Being a better listener. Okay. That's more interest in listening than in speaking your point. Okay, good. Anything else, Shannon? Tone. 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 A gentle tone. Don. Uh, not judging. Not judging. Okay. Yeah, good. What about um, respect? How do you know you're treating someone with respect? Not interrupted. <laughs> That's a great one, isn't it? Isn't that so frustrating when you're interrupted? Yeah. Okay, wait until someone's finished what they want to say. Anything else? Respect? Kind of acknowledging where they're coming from, where they're coming from. Okay. Acknowledging that it's meaningful to them. Yeah. All right, you don't have to agree with it, but at least acknowledge that it's meaningful and it's reasonable for them to think what they think. Yeah. I think also the being attentive to them, not looking at your phone or looking around or listening to what somebody else is saying. 
attention. Giving it them your full attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. But don't make assumptions that they said this one thing and then take it that they must believe this is and this um, and right. therefore that's stupid or whatever. Take each thing at face value yeah. and don't don't run ahead and, mm -hmm. and, and see that as a a sign of everything else that you you imagine they believe, but they may not. Were you going to add something? Yeah, no when to stop. <laughs> no <laughs> when to stop. Uh, uh, so you might have a bucket full of evidences, but emptying the entire bucket over their head <laughs> in one go may not actually help. You may want to pick one thing out of the bucket to share with them. I don't know where the metaphor goes with that, but anyway, that's, that's fine. As long as you don't kick the bucket. Um, we are, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be useful to people. Here's something, you've got a question, you might find this useful. And it's up to them if they want to uh, take it on board, but then that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we're there for, to be useful. Uh, so tonight we're going to tackle this topic of did Jesus exist? And then we're going to go on next week to talk about did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did he, did he live again? And actually not next week because there's a, a one week hiatus. So Tidu is doing a class, I think, with Michelle on some of our uh, approach to the needy. The week after we'll carry on. And the week after that uh, we'll do a class on if there is a good God, why is there suffering in the world and that kind of thing. Now, let me just say this. We've got about 25, 30 minutes for each of these classes. Uh, we could teach for 10 weeks on each one of them. So the goal is not to give us everything about these topics. The goal is to give us some little things that we can use to help other people to develop greater trust in, in the Christian faith. So we, we're limiting what we're trying to achieve here to something that I hope will be useful. Now in talking about this topic of did Jesus really exist, um, I've decided to focus not on the Bible. And of course, that, that's not to say I don't think it's important or it's not useful in this uh, uh, topic. However, a lot of people have an innate skepticism towards the reliability of this. And the reliability of the documents is something we can do another class on another time and it's very well worth doing. But if that, that can be something you, that person may not be willing to get into at this point, but they might be willing to talk about the existence of Jesus from other sources. So we're going to focus on Roman sources and Jewish sources that show that Jesus did exist, and this may hopefully be helpful. So how are we going to approach this? Well, I suggest a few things before we get into the details of what Tacitus wrote. The first is, you want to find out what your friend already believes. If they say they don't believe in the existence of Jesus, what does that actually mean? Do they have any belief in God? Do they have any faith of any kind? So it would be very helpful to find out what they believe to begin with. What they think of Jesus, too. If they don't think he existed, do they think he was a mythical figure? Do they think he was an ideal figure? Some kind of archetype? What do they actually think of Jesus will be helpful to know. The second thing you want to perhaps ask them is what kind of evidence would they need to be able to believe in Jesus? Like what might convince you? Now, even if you can't provide that, even just knowing that that's what they would think would help them to believe is useful to know. So what kind of evidence? Thirdly, you might like to ask them if they're open to revising their opinion on the non-existence of Jesus if you are able to show them reasonable grounds to believe in the existence of Jesus. You don't have to ask that question, depends on your friend, but you might want to find out, test the water a little bit, are you open to changing your mind? Can be a useful thing to ask. Um, clearly something happened, or we wouldn't have Christendom, 2,000 years of it. That doesn't happen from nothing, it doesn't happen randomly, right? Something happened. And so we're looking at these questions, particularly this one today, to try and, try and figure out, well, if Jesus didn't exist, how did this happen? But if he did exist, does it make it more plausible? Which I would argue it does. Let's talk about our sources. Okay, so first of all, Tacitus, who was born around 55 or 56, uh, after uh, well, CE, as it's called now, Common Era, or AD, as we would know it from the past. Uh, he might have been, some people say, the best of all the Roman historians. He was Roman and a historian. And uh, the bits we're going to look at tonight are written in his style. So some people would say 
Uh, maybe this was altered later, but we have a number of copies and uh, it's written in the kind of language and the kind of phrasing uh, that he used in the rest of his writings. So it would be an extraordinarily clever person to be able to, to fabricate his style accurately in the passages we're going to look at today, which I think uh, are on your handout. So what do we have? We have uh, his Annals is one of his uh, books, uh, written 116 or 117 AD. Uh, written uh, in this section uh, about uh, Nero. It includes a biography of Nero and the incident when Rome burned in 64 AD, which you may have heard of before. Let's look at this quote, which I think is also on the handout. He writes this, Neither human effort, nor the emperor's generosity, nor the placating of the gods, ended the scandalous belief that the fire had been ordered by Nero. Therefore, to put down the rumor, <coughs> Nero substituted as culprits and punished in the most usual ways those hated for their shameful acts whom the crowd called Christians. The founder of this name, Christ, or Christus in Latin, had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Suppressed for a time, the deadly superstition erupted again, not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, you understand he doesn't think Christ Christianity is a good thing, <laughs> um, but also in the city, which is Rome, where all things horrible and shameful from everywhere come together and become popular. <laughs> huh? That sounds like the places we know. Maybe we visit it. Um, so th this is what uh, he is uh, writing here, and I'm going to ask you to look at that and think about this for a minute. Now, from this, what do we learn about Jesus? What do we know? This is someone who was opposed to Christianity, not in favor of Christianity, looking back on an incident that he's recording that happened in the time of Nero, when, uh, in the first century, when many of the early Christians were obviously alive there. And, and so, from this, what do we know about Jesus? What would you say are the things that we can pick out and say from a, an enemy of Christianity is telling us about Jesus, but and Christianity, if you like? Rachel, one thing each, right? Not six things each. So one thing here, Rachel. He obviously existed, otherwise, why would he have mentioned him? Okay, why would he have that unless he did exist? Yeah, okay, Ben? Controversial. He was controversial? Yeah, okay. He was executed. He was executed. Okay, so he died, yes, and, and by execution. Yeah, what else? Uh, John? He was the founder of a movement. People call it. Okay, he founded it. He's known as that, you know, really? During the reign of Tiberius. Okay, so Tiberius, so we can check those dates and see if that fits with what is claimed about Jesus. Yeah, what else? Um, he was executed by Pontius Pilate, again, okay, can we can change, check, check those dates from other sources outside the Bible as to whether they fit, yeah? Came from Judea. Came from Judea, okay, mm -hmm. so the right area of the world, okay, what else do we have? Anything else? There's a good few things here in one short little paragraph, aren't there? Yeah. Confirming what we believe about Jesus and what the Bible tells us yeah. about Jesus. It fits. What are the chances of someone fitting all of those and not being Jesus? Yeah. Or being someone mythical that didn't exist, why would that be written? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Here's what I picked out. Um, someone called Christus existed, and it must be the Christ. Um, he founded the movement, he gave his name to the movement, although he's thinking of the name as Christus, or Christus, where obviously his name is really Jesus, but he, his understanding is is that uh, that's his name. He was executed, executed by the Roman governor of Judea during the governorship of Pontius Pilate, during the reign of Tiberius. Christianity spread to Rome, right? We know that, again, from the New Testament, and it began in Judea. I think we got most of it pretty quickly, so that's good. So what, those are some things that uh, we know from, um, from Tacitus. Let's now go from a Roman historian to a Jewish historian, Josephus. Now, what do we know about Josephus? He was born around 37, 38 AD or CE, and he lived to around the end of the century or the beginning of the next century, roughly. Uh, he was a Jewish priest and a, and a soldier. He fought against the Romans, was taken prisoner by the Romans, and then had an epiphany. 
and enlightened them, where he said, oh my word, you Romans are jolly fine fellows. I tell you what, I'll serve you instead of uh, the Jewish people as a priest. I shall now write histories and serve you. And he got connected with the aristocracy of Rome and made a nice tidy living for himself. And he was seen by the Jewish people then as a traitor uh, from that point on. He was very positive about Judaism and wanted to defend it. So in his writings, he's very uh, that way. But um, he was seen more as, uh, as a traitor. He wrote Jewish history for a Roman audience. That was the perspective. Um, in his book, J uh, uh, Jewish Antiquities, he mentions Jesus twice. We're going to look at both of these and then ask the same question we asked earlier about the writings of Tacitus. What does this tell us about Jesus? So we'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, so that's, a, in fact, a, a, a photograph of a copy of his writings of Jewish Antiquities written in uh, those dates. So here, being therefore this kind of person, in other words, a heartless Sadducee, he's writing here about Ananus. Ananus, thinking that he had a favorable opportunity because Festus had died and Albinus was still on his way, called a meeting, and that word literally is a Sanhedrin, of judges, and brought into it the brother of Jesus who is called Messiah, James by name, and some others, he made the accusation that they had transgressed the law, and he handed them over to be stoked. I'm not going to examine this text right now, but just have a look at that, think about that, and just think about what does that tell us about Jesus. This is Josephus writing in the first century about, actually he's writing about James, but he references Jesus. Why does he reference James? Why does he reference James in, in connection with Jesus? What's going on there? Why would Josephus do that? Think about that as we, uh, we come back uh, in a moment to it. Just to say, though, that um, there, there are lots of Jameses in that period in Jewish history. And in fact, there are lots of Jesuses. Jesus is a very common name in, in the first century. Um, and so is James. And so it's interesting that he tells us or tell his audience which James it is and which Jesus it is by referencing that Jesus is called Messiah, the one, everybody must know that one, that one. You know, not the other Jesus is, but the one known as the Messiah, right? You all know that one? Yeah, okay, him, right. And he's writing to Romans, by the way, not even Jews. So some, he's writing to people who must know this. And the James is referenced as being the brother of that guy. So it's, it's really interesting that he would uh, do that. And it tells us something very positive about the existence of Jesus. Um, the extraneous reference to Jesus here would not have made any sense if Jesus had not been a real person. Now, slightly more controversial, but still interesting. In Book 18 of the same uh, book, Jewish Antiquities, he, ha he references Jesus again, but there is some question as to whether all of this quote is authentic. So, on your sheets and on the screen, I've put in italics the words that scholars think might have been added later, possibly by Christians or Christian type people or sympathizers of Christians. Um, so we, we're not certain that the words in italics were written by Josephus, but we are sure that the words that aren't in italics were written by Jesus, uh, by Josephus. And I think you'll see that they still tell us a great deal about uh, what Josephus thought about Jesus. So let's read this one. Around this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who did surprising deeds, and a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who in the first place came to love him did not give up their affection for him, for on the third day he appeared to them restored to life. The prophets of God had prophesied this and countless other marvellous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, have still to this day not died out. So, now, take... And in evaluating this, the usefulness of this, take out the italicized words for a moment, right? Just pretend they're not there. Let's assume that the scholars who think they were not written by Josephus are correct. I mean, let's take a minimalist approach here. I think that's, that's a healthy thing to do. So ignore those and then um, think about 
think about what we know about Jesus from these two passages combined. So again, if you want to look at the handout you've got, or you want to look on the screen, take a moment to think, what does this tell us that we're confident of about Jesus, if you like also about Christianity? What would you say? What do we see here written by Josephus that is interesting, useful, supportive of the existence of Jesus? What do we see? Uh, yeah, Josie. Jesus had a brother named James. Okay, he had a brother named James. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yep. He was crucified. Crucified. Okay, which is, didn't happen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And didn't happen normally to people who weren't um, uh, committing the highest crimes. Okay. He was the Messiah. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that's nearly what, isn't it? Yes, Jesus was called Messiah, so he was known as Messiah. Well, Josephus certainly wouldn't have believed he was the Messiah. Uh, he was he wanted to support Judaism, but certainly he knew that he was called the Messiah. Okay, what else do we know about Jesus from this, Ben? It's surprising deeds. Surprising deeds. All right, so that must have been pretty out of the ordinary, because there are lots of famous people at that time who might have done something unusual, but this is something really out of the ordinary, it, to mention it as something that would identify him to his readers. Uh, Ash? No, he was a teacher. A teacher. He went around teaching. Okay, yeah. Anything else? And many Jewish and Greek followers. Jewish followers and Greek followers. So attractive as a religion to Jews, but from a Jewish background, people from a Gentile uh, background. Okay, yeah. Okay, Pilate comes into the equation the same as we had with Tacitus. All right. Uh, Ian? And then I see, uh Teacher of truth, his ministry was effective to Jews, Jews and Greeks, accused by ruling Jewish authorities. Just think about how many of these things fit with the New Testament. Um, Pilate was the one who sentenced him to crucifixion. His followers continued their discipleship, which fits with the book of Acts and what we know. His followers were called Christians and he was known as Messiah. He founded a new movement and it was still thriving at the time of writing, which is at the end of the century. Now, how, you know, if Jesus did not exist, put the first list from Tacitus together with the second list, and there's some overlap, some slight differences, um, some duplication. Um, how do we explain that unless someone called Jesus existed? Uh, there's, there's no reason to fabricate this because it doesn't support the points that Tacitus is making or the points that Josephus is making for a non-Christian audience. So he's not trying to carry favour, either of those writers, he's not trying to carry favour with Christians, he's trying to prove something to Romans in particular, uh, both writers actually. So we have a lot there. Now I've referenced in your handout some other writers, which we're not going to look at tonight, these are all non-Christian writers. Um, Lucian of Samosata, who was writing in the 2nd century, uh, who wrote a satirical let a, a letter that you might want to look up online. Uh, Celsus, second century Greek philosopher and an opponent of Christianity. You can look up his uh, uh, discourse. Uh, Pliny the Younger uh, lived from 61 AD to the middle, uh, beginning of the second century. Pliny the Younger who writes about Christians in uh, the area he's governing. Um, Suetonius uh, lived at 69 AD, uh, 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 beyond that a Roman historian. 
uh, who also writes about uh, Nero and Claudius in connection with Christianity and Christians, and Mara Bar, Bar Serapion, a Stoic philosopher and Syrian, uh, who wrote a letter to his son referencing Christianity and Jesus. These, I, I think they're less easy to digest than the ones I put on screen earlier from Tacitus and Josephus, which is why I've used those. And I don't think you need to remember all of this, but I think it's helpful to our faith to, re to look at it, to look it up and read it and think about it, and have it somewhere in a pocket, you know, or maybe just in the pocket of your memory to be able to bring out and say, well, have you read what Suetonius wrote? If people say, no, I, have a, I, don't, I don't believe Jesus existed. Well, did you know that Josephus did? And he wasn't sympathetic to Christianity. And have you read what he wrote? Well, would you like to? You know, and you can these days get your phone out and Google it and, and show it to them right there and then. You don't have to memorize it all. So that's quite good news, isn't it? Um, so we're not going to look at those uh, tonight, but I'd like you to think about that. Look them up online. This writer uh, said this, Robert Van Vers, if any Jewish writer were ever in a position to know about the non-existence of Jesus, it would have been Josephus. He's the guy. He wouldn't know. His implicit affirmation of the existence of Jesus has been, and still is, the most significant obstacle for those who argue that the extra-biblical evidence is not probative. It doesn't give enough proof. It doesn't show enough evidence. It is interesting that no early writers disputed the existence of Jesus. They disputed whether he was the son of God or Messiah. They disputed whether he should be listened to. Me. They disputed whether he was a good moral person or not. They disputed lots of things about Jesus, but no one in the first and second century, Jewish, Roman, or any of any other kind, um, disputed the existence of Jesus. And if you wanted to squish a religion, which the Jews did and the Romans did at periods in their history, the easiest thing to do would be to attack the existence of the founder. If you knew the founder didn't exist and you knew the founders. Uh, the people who followed him knew he didn't exist. But they don't, they don't do that. They try and discredit Christians, but they don't try and prove that Jesus did not exist. The Romans didn't try to prove it. The rabbinic Judaism didn't try to prove it because they knew, too many people knew, that, of course, he did exist. And so it was a futile exercise to try and prove that uh, he did not. So, wrapping up. Some suggested questions uh, for your friend. Having perhaps been through this material, or some of it, you could ask these questions. How does this evidence affect your view of Jesus? It's, a, it's an open-ended question. How does this affect your view of Jesus? What do you now think about Jesus? Secondly, how does it affect your view of Christianity, or perhaps the followers of Jesus? And thirdly, would you like to know more? It depends on their perspective, of course. And a handy scripture to share is John 7, 17. Yes. If you really want to know if this works, then you might want to try putting it into practice. If you do the will of God, you will find out whether my teaching is from God or whether I just speak of my own. Now I'm going to finish with uh, a small thing here. We'll try to help us remember. This is the best I could do. I'm hoping in this room some of us will come up with better ideas to remember Tacitus and Josephus. Remember those two names, right? And so for Tacitus, um, the first three letters reversed are cat. <laughs> and he wrote about the burning of Rome, and so there's a cat burning for you to remind you of Rome burning and Tacitus. Does that help? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, so cat, Tacitus, burning, right, Tacitus. Cat, Tacitus, okay, all right. With Josephus, I couldn't do any better than just finding a sign that said Joseph and sons, right? So, because Joseph was the father of Jesus and of James, right? So Joseph had sons. And so Joseph was Josephus. You see, got Joseph there? So, right? We'll talk after. Um, so, I don't know, but if we can just do our best to remember Tacitus and Josephus, that's enough to get you onto your mobile device just to look it up if you need to when you're with your friend who wants to read that and have a look at it. Okay? Tacitus, burning cat, Josephus, Joseph and sons, that helps, um, and I'm a lucky guy. Uh, you've got some added extra resources on the handout you can look up, and next week we're going to look at the topic of did Jesus really rise from the dead. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much.